observe the Aradhana Mahotsavam that just happened um, last Friday that we observed this uh, past Friday and as we continue to reminisce or be Lord Bhagavan's glorious life and recollect his divine message we are very very blessed to have brother Dr. Shashank Shah amidst us to share Swami's divine messages and brother Shashank really needs no introduction with his wonderful talk this past Friday at the Aradhana also program. He really needs no introduction to any of us anymore. But just for the benefit of those who have, who may have missed, Dr. Shashank Shah is an alum of Sri Satasai University, where he completed his MBA and PhD in corporate stakeholder management. And he has received a number of awards a few among them are the President of India Gold Medal and the Governor's Gold Medal for Excellence in MBA and MPhil programs at Sri Satchasai Institute of Higher Learning. He also received the Association of Indian Management Scholars International Outstanding Doctoral Management Student Award in 2011 at Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad and also received Human Resources College Golden Alumnus Award 2011 from the Sharif of Mumbai for his research achievements. He has published a number of research-based papers and case studies in the areas of values-based management, stakeholder management, and social responsibility. And a key contribution among them has been a book that was recently published entitled Soulful Corporations. He has also been the editor of university's publication division and he has compiled and edited over a dozen books on Indian ethos and values-based message of our beloved Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. He has many more outstanding awards and uh, achievements to his credit and I'm really forced to keep this short in the interest of time because all of us are so curious to hear from him, his thoughts and uh, his experiences with Swami and uh, the messages that he wants to share. Now, he has specifically requested that we make this a very interactive Q&A exercise. So please um, uh, participate in the Q&A with any questions that you would like Brother Shashank to address. And uh, we also have index cards that we can pass around if you want to write your questions on index cards, we can collect them and give it to Brother Shashank. Uh, he really wants to make this an interactive Q&A. He wants to make this a dialogue, so please have any, if you have any questions that you want uh, Brother Shashank to address, please pass them around on the index cards. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brother Shashank Shah. Offering my loving pranams at Bhagwan's divine lotus feet. Sairam to all my brothers and sisters and elders here on this Sunday morning in the Chicago Metro Center. I'm so glad that I could be a part of the Chicago community for the last three days and get to meet so many, many devotees, get to know their experiences, get to know the work that's happening in this region and see how Swami is silently working in so many families far, far away from Prashantakalim. And that's the real, real mission and message of Swami in action. So it's been a learning experience for me as well. And I'm so grateful to the organizers for having invited me and of course to Swami for making this possible. I thought that this particular session, we can have it as a Q&A. Uh, that depends a lot on the cues that may be there so that the A's can be attempted. And if that's not the case, and if there aren't many cues, then I will move to having 
uh, a session on sharing some experiences from my side about my personal journey with Swami and some of the issues related to what I have learned from Bhagwan. So let, 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 let's take a joint call as to what we should do. your sweet photographs. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll do this. We'll start with uh, some experience sharing from my side. There are three questions which I have here. Uh, one or two of them I can answer as a part of my talk itself. And some more as they come in, we can have them taken as we progress. So I guess the time is still 12.15 or 12.30? 12.15. Right. So I'll just uh, share uh, a couple of experiences from my side about uh, my journey with Bhagwan. So, uh, at, uh, at the Swami's University in Prashantanilayam, actually it started as a college in 1968 at Anantapur, and then at 1669 as a boys' college in Brindavan, and then in 79 in Prashantanilayam, which culminated in the university in 1981. The establishment of university itself is a great uh, uh, sort of a miracle because as per Indian law, you cannot have a university, two universities within the vicinity of 50 kilometers, especially out of the metro areas. So while in big cities, you will have many universities close to each other because you have large populations to cater to. But as you go, in, you go inside into the interiors, this kind of rule existed then. And there was always the Krishna Devaraya University, which was there at Anantpur, which is the headquarters. So it was a matter of concern as to how this university will come up. And uh, Swami had said sometime in the mid 70s, uh, he was giving a discourse, and Swami said that uh, these colleges will ultimately become a university. So, Dr. Suri Bhagwantam, who was the uh, chief scientific advisor to the government of India, director of IISC, and also a great scientist in his own right, used to translate Swami's discourses from Telugu to English. So, he used to uh, discuss with Swami, and when Swami announced that there will be university here, and he said after the discourse is over, he said, Swami, it is not possible, it is not permitted by the government. Uh, we may not be able to have a university in Puttaparthi. So Swami said, there will be a university in Puttaparthi and I will, when I give a discourse on the inauguration of the university, you will only translate the discourse. That's what Swami told Dr. Bhagwan. And in 1982, when the university was, in, uh, 81, when the university was inaugurated, it happened just like that. Swami was giving discourse. And Dr. Bhagavantam was translating and in that discourse, Swami said this, Bhagavantam was telling me five years back that there cannot be a university in Puttaparthi. And I told him that time that I will give a discourse on the inauguration of the university and you will only be translating the discourse. And here he is translating the discourse. And Dr. Bhagavantam ended up doing the translation of what I said in English, which Swami had originally said in Telugu. So that's the way Swami has, has always worked. He has worked in ways which we cannot understand, what appears to be impossible. He has used the human endeavor as an avatar to achieve all divine tasks. To show each one of us how each one of us has the potential to use our human endeavor with noble intentions and purity of actions to achieve divine tasks. So there are about four categories of students who came to Swami. One, the first category of students who came to Swami was as early as the uh, days in the Vrindavan when there was an old bungalow. Three Vrindavan was also not constructed. And they had extraordinary opportunities to live in Swami's physical proximity. There used to be a room called the safe room where Swami used to sit with the students before coming out for darshan. And after darshan was over, he used to sit there and the students used to be sitting around Swami. They were numbering a few dozen. The kind of opportunities there were extraordinary. In fact, one such opportunity I recollect uh, one of our teachers, uh, Ramakrishna Reddy sir, he is one of the senior most alumnus of the university. He is a teacher also at the higher secondary school at Prashantanilayam. He was sharing how, how intimate and how close the students were with Swami. So there was an occasion, there was a, that, that, let's say, that room which was called a safe room had two parts to it. So one part of it was this side and the other part was 
the other part of it was on the other side there was a door between the two so that side was swami's personal area and this side was uh, where the students used to wait for swami there was a chair for swami to sit so the boys were waiting for swami to come out and uh, uh ramkrishna reddy sir came in a little late so they with, with actions usually with students when they are around swami and swami is not there we will uh, talk with the eyes means where is swami that kind of an interaction so he asked so then they said uh, swami is inside he is combing his hair he is coming out for darshan usually before coming out for darshan swami used to comb his hair nice he used to comb his hair well because once swami said you know why i have to be so particular about my hair because if my hair is not the way it is always there the lady devotees wonder that my health is not proper so i have to be extra careful that i need to comb my hair properly before i come out so they said where is he i mean in that eye he said he is inside he is combing his hair so ramkrishna ji sir thought these boys were joking so he walked inside the inner room he was much senior he had the access and swami was really inside he physically he did not know what was happening outside and then when he saw ramkrishna ji sir he said what happened they told you i am combing my hair why did you come inside <laughs> so that's the kind of proximity they enjoyed they just could get inside swami's aid personal room they used to talk to him they used to sit around him it was literally a matter of great joy like the days of earlier vrindavan when all the gopalas had an opportunity to stay with krishna or even for that matter the close disciples of jesus had an opportunity to stay with him and learn from him directly then there was a second generation of uh, students coming in the 80s when the university was formed and swami donned the role of a chancellor <coughs> and if we observe one thing i observed after uh, i did a lot i keep thinking about why swami did this and why swami did that and once swami donned the role of the chancellor of the university in india chancellor of the university is called kulapati you are an acharya you are a, supposed to be at a technical level an exemplary figure who through his acharana behavior sets an example for all the students Swami modified and changed his personal life in order to fit that role so perfectly. If you observe, it was post 1981 once the university started that 98% of the occasions Swami used to wear only the orange robe. Prior to that, Swami used to wear pink sometimes. He used to wear red sometimes. In the earlier Vrindavan days, Swami used to primarily wear red robe and have lot of variations. Then it became very very regimented. orange on all days white on birthdays purple on convocation days that kind of discipline he imposed on himself we see after that swami stopped accepting garlands for himself we saw that swami stopped eating pan there's one very interesting episode of how swami stopped eating pan and there was a conversation which i was having with one of the devotees in chicago they didn't know when that had happened so it had happened in 1982 swami took up the responsibility of being the first chancellor of the university and he continues to be the founder chancellor of our university and uh, dr bk goka who was the first vice chancellor he was awarded the tyanpit award and the committee came to prashanti nilayam to give the award to him because he was unable to go and receive the award in person so this committee was blessed by swami with an interview one of the members of that interview team who was inside had a habit of having snuff you know what snuff is in india you blow it into your nose and you get a kind of a uh, you get a kind of a kick as you say in terms of when you smoke or you have any such uh, other addictive items so he had a habit of having snuff and he was from the government side i guess and then uh, obviously when you have snuff your your fingers your kerchief everything is black because of the color of that snuff so all of all over the place it was black for that man and then swami himself told him in the course of the conversation that it is not good to have snuff it's not good for your health why don't you give up the habit towards the end of the interview swami saw that on his own white kerchief there were pan marks now the pan that swami used to have was very simple pan the normal betel nut leaf with little bit of chuna and little bit of arkena in indian tradition it is supposed to be very healthy to have pan especially after food because it acts as a very good digestive and if you have it without food it is it, it is a sort of a, a kind of a mixture which reduces your hunger so in 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 spirituality you will see most of the masters having pan in some form or the other swami was very very simple one so he saw the pan marks on his uh, on his kerchief and then immediately it struck to him this is recorded in general chipper's uh, book mahavakya on leadership 
Swami refer, Swami immediately thought to himself and then later on he shared when he stopped having pan. He said that when I saw the red marks on my kerchief, I realized that when I am telling others that a particular habit is not good, how myself I can have a habit, howsoever healthy it may be for the body. So I decided from that day that I will not have pan. And Swami gave up the habit of having pan. Now that was a great loss for the students and devotees because ha Swami having pan was a great opportunity for them. And I'll tell you why. Because every day evening after Aarti, there were two or three of these rare opportunities which were there, which were, which were a part of the whole schedule. And what was that? One was that one boy will give Aarti along with the Pujari. Another boy will go and garland Swami and a third boy will go with a box of paan and have Swami take one piece, one uh, uh, paan from that for his consumption after the aarti is over and when he is going back to the residence. When Swami stopped consuming paan, when Swami stopped accepting garlands, all of these opportunities were lost. So the students were at a great loss that why Swami has stopped all of these activities and that's when Swami shared with them that the importance of discipline, the importance of giving up so-called habits which we have had for all our life and the need to lead an exemplary life. So Swami himself donned this role upon himself to do everything that he expects the students to do, however so small it may be. So that was the second batch of students who had that kind of opportunities, who saw the college become the university and see Prashantinilayam grow into a university town. The third batch of students, the third generation of students were the ones who came in 1990s and they were the ones who saw Prashant Nilayam get converted into an international township. You had the super speciality hospital coming up, you had the airport coming up, you had the beautiful uh, sands of, of the Prashant Nilayam Mandir get converted into the Sai Kulwant Hall. You saw the university expanding much more, professional programs coming in, laboratories growing up, all of these things happening, they saw Swami getting into a total institutional mode of making these things happen. And then the last generation of students who came to Swami was in the 2000s, the millennium kids. They came into Swami's fold in 2000. By then Swami's physical activities had reduced, gradually his interactions were limited and a lot of it was focused more on message rather than personal opportunities. And so these batch of students got a lot of opportunities to give speeches before Swami, to present Kulvanthar programs before Swami, to do music programs before Swami, to have so many, many, many activities where they could offer their skills and talents to Bhagwan. The whole thing changed from Swami doing everything and students watching him. Swami turned it around to students doing most of the things and Swami guiding them as to how to do it better. So in the 40 years that Swami had spearheaded the educational institutions, these were the four distinct categories and I was blessed to come in the last category. In the, there was a part of the millennium kids who came in the year, in the 2000 decade and we saw Swami in a very, very different light in terms of Swami molding us purely on the basis of his message. Opportunities, experiences were limited. It was more of a message oriented relation where Swami directly made us hit the ground running. It was not a gradual evolution from primary to secondary to university, etc. etc. At this, in, the, in, the, in the relationship with him, in the spiritual journey with him, we were directly in the final level. So, I always had a desire to join Swami's university. Sometimes from my uh, early college days, when I was doing in, in, in India, there is this junior college, 11th and 12th class. So, I had this desire that I should go to Swami's college. But my father always had the desire that I should come to US and get some experience, international experience, so that that would help me. It's typical of any parent who is interested that his student, his son, his child does well in terms of getting all-round experience. So we had uh, applied for a green card because my grandparents were settled here in US and through the legal process we got one. And just around the time I started coming to US for the, uh, for as part of the green card, I started coming here in order to do the mandatory visits as and when required because I was still studying in India. I had the opportunity of going to retreats here. So I had attended the Northeastern region retreats in Albany where they are held at Troy and started getting the opportunity of listening to so many, many speakers. So many students of Swami used to come there. So I remember Vedanarayan sir coming here there and talking about his experiences with Swami. So that created that strong desire in me to come to Prashantinam and study in Swami's university. And I started praying to Swami for giving me an opportunity that I should join his university. 
By the time I finished my college education and was ready to join the MBA program, I had made up my mind that I want to go to Prashant. In some corner of my father's mind, the desire that I should go abroad was very much still there. Somehow, I convinced him that I should be permitted to go to Prashant Nilay. The problem was that Prashant Nilay exams are held in May, entrance exams. Mumbai University final exams are held in the month of May. Both of them invariably clash. You have them at the same time. So if someone is interested from Mumbai University to go and write Prashant Nilay exams, then you are expected to wait for one year because you have to finish your final exams and then apply for the entrance exams. So I was praying to Swami, Swami, if, if you want me to join your university, you have to do something because although I cannot wait for one year doing nothing, my father will not permit that. I will lose the opportunity of joining your university. So please do something. Saying so, I wrote a letter and sent it with one of the Balvikas teachers uh, sometime in the September of 2001. In November 2001, after Swami's birthday celebrations were over, for the first time in the history of Mumbai University, instead of the exams getting postponed, the exams got advanced and instead of May, the exams got advanced to March. So all the Mumbai University exams got over by the first week of April and I was then successfully able to write the entrance exams in May in Prashant in 2002 and by Swami's grace, I also got admission into the MBA program. So that's how my journey with Swami physically began. In 2002, we had the last summer course. We had the opportunity of uh, going through what summer course is like and how Swami used to give us in, uh, uh, discourses every single day of the summer course and the kind of interest he had in ensuring that the students are exposed to the Indian scriptures, to the Indian way of life and that kind of discipline and orientation should be provided right at the commencement of their educational journey in the institution is what I saw Swami actually leading in those 15 days. And that was the, unfortunately the last summer course but luckily for me it was my first and the only one and I had the opportunity of going through it. Some of my senior brothers who were here who were a part of the university had the opportunity of going through so many of them and they would recollect the wonderful opportunities that summer courses used to provide to students. So in the very first interaction which happened on 18th of June 2002, Swami, I, my mother had given a letter to Swami. It was sealed, it was cellotaped fully because it was sent with one of the devotees. I, I was sitting in the Dashan line, I, uh, stood, I, mean, I was just showing the letter and then Swami called me and he took the letter. And he said, this is not your letter, this is your mother's letter. I said, yes Swami. Then he opened that letter which was sealed, that whole letter was written in Gujarati script. For about two minutes, Swami read the whole letter and then from there he mentioned a couple of things which were very very close personal family matters which my mother had not written in the letter in Gujarati script which Swami apparently read but he asked very pertinent questions which were relevant to the family and then in that one interaction he indicated that he knows exactly what is there in our mind and what is it that we have been praying to him in our mind in terms of blessing us or guiding us. So that one single interaction was enough to communicate the omniscience of Swami at a very physical level. That was my very very first physical interaction with Swami when I spoke to him, rather he spoke to me, I uh, got an opportunity to talk to Bhagwan. Same time I was in the hostel, I got a dream and in the dream I was sitting with Swami, there were other students, all freshers who had come to join the university and Swami was sitting on the chair. And after a few introductory conversations, Swami called me and he said, you know, this boy, he wanted to go to Harvard University or Stanford University in America, but he did not go there. Instead of that, he has joined my university. I am very happy. I was just wondering to myself why Swami is saying this in the dream. I have already made a decision. I don't have any desire to go anywhere. Why should uh, Swami mention like that? Maybe there is some significance. I left it at that. You move on to April 2003, uh, it was a summer period, we had holidays and uh, my gra paternal grandmother was at home. I am trying to actually take you through my journey with Swami to show how, how he has guided physically and metaphysically in this journey that I have led till now and that how that is true for most of us. So in 2003, summer vacation time, my grandmother wanted me to come home and I didn't want to lose that opportunity and I wanted to stay with Swami. So I wrote a letter to Swami, Swami, if you permit me, I will go home for a few days and come. 
uh, uh, I couriered that letter to Swami. We had the opportunity of couriering it, and uh, as is the case, that letter used to be sent to Swami's residence. Whether he read that letter or not, we don't know, but we had the satisfaction, like always, that we have given the letter to Swami. I informed the warden that, sir, I have written a letter to Swami and I wish to leave. The warden said, why do you want to go? Swami may go to Kodaikanal. All students who are here may have a chance to get selected. I would suggest you don't go for, you don't go home. So that made me thinking, I said, okay, if that's what he's suggesting, let me not go home. So I had already booked my ticket, I went and I cancelled the ticket. The next day I went to the city and cancelled the ticket. That very day when I had gone to the city and cancelled the ticket, the warden had sent somebody to look for me to tell me, don't cancel the ticket, if you want to go, you go. I am not forcing you, I am not giving you any hints, I am just suggesting, so don't change your decision because of me. But I that, that, that person couldn't find me anywhere because I had gone to the city along with one of the seniors to get the ticket cancelled. That time Vrindavan didn't have all the facilities like we have now. This is about 14 years, 13, 14 years back. And the third day when I came back was the day when I was going to leave. The, uh, I was going to leave uh, the, the fourth day. The, the next day I was going to leave and the fourth day uh, I was sitting in the Darshan line. The third day when the day I was going to leave, the warden asked me, he said, what happened? I was not able to find you. That person looked for you everywhere. I wanted to tell you that you can cancel the ticket. You don't cancel the ticket. If you want, you can go. I said, no sir, I have already gone and cancelled the ticket from the city. He said, I have not told you to cancel it. You have cancelled it on your own. Tomorrow, if you don't get a chance to go to Kedahina, don't blame me that you told me, sir, that uh, you, uh, don't go home and now Swami has not even taken me, etc. etc. You know what kind of uh, dilemmatic situation this can be for the teachers and the wardens and the principals of Swami's institution. So the fourth day, when I was sitting in Darshan line, Swami comes to me and then he looks at me smilingly and he said, in Hindi he said, letter likha kal ghar jata hai. Now that word kal has so many meanings. It kal means yesterday, kal also means tomorrow. Letter likha kal ghar jata hai can also mean that you wrote the letter yesterday that you are going home. It also means that you wrote a letter that yesterday you are going home. So that one sentence has so many meanings. The people around me thought that I had written a letter yesterday that I am going home. I knew that I had written a letter that yesterday I was going home. Right? So you see the difference for the people who see you to say Swami say something and what actually Swami means only the person will. So I came, I understood what he was doing. He was waiting for me to take a decision whether I want to stay back or go. Once I decided that I don't want to go for vacation, I'll stay back. That's when he intervened and came back and said, ah, I know, you wanted to go home. What happened? I said, Swami, I'm not going, I'm here only. Are you sure? I said, yes, Swami. He smiled and he moved on. Needless to say, till about a fortnight later, when Swami actually went to Kodakana, I was blessed to go with Swami to Kodakana. That time when we were at the airport, the warden who had accompanied for that trip, he said, see, you took a wise decision by cancelling your ticket, but I didn't want to influence your decision. You took your own decision and Swami was happy about it and now you have an opportunity to go with Bhagwan to Kodakana. So it's like this, you take the first step. These are whatever philosophical statements that Swami often makes. We actually try to find parallels to that in our daily life. You take one step towards me, I will take a hundred towards you. What do these mean? These mean as simple things as like this. You take one step towards me of deciding to do with, be with me and I will take the rest of the steps to ensure that your decision of being with me is fully fructified. Now we proceed, we go to October 2003. This was a session in Purnachandra. I had mentioned on the other day about uh, the Vice Chancellor's Conference and we had an opportunity to uh, do a rehearsal in front of Bhagavan in Purnachandra. We were just eight or nine students of us and Swami, the Vice Chancellor, Registrar and the board. And in that, at that time, there was a time when I had to take a call whether I want to continue my green card or not. Because you can't stay out of the US for long. Every year you need to come. Sometimes you take a re-entry permit, you can come in once in two years. So that once in two years period also was coming to an end. And my father was really particular that I should take a decision and I should continue to hold on to the opportunity of having a green card because you know what it means in this country to have an immigrant status, it gives you so many so-called privileges to have an employment, etc. Et so I was I had written a letter to Swami and I was sitting there. He took the letter, he saw the letter and then uh, 
I had written there, Swami, I need your guidance whether I should continue with my green card, what I should do, etc. etc. Then Swami looked at me and said, Ha, go to America. So I was I, I knew that there is something more than what meets the eye because such simple and straightforward instructions don't come mutually. So I was saying, no, Swami, it is not like that that I want to go. He said, no, no, go, go, America, go, America. He kept on saying so many times. Then I kept quiet. Then after some time, we were served snacks. And in that, there was idli, there was chutney, and there were some other items which students were given. And Swami was sitting there. And we were all sitting around Swami and eating. After some time, he looked at me and he said, uh, if you go to America, you will not get chutney there. He said like <laughs> So, I knew that something very, very potent has come from Swami. It is converted into a joke, but there is definitely some meaning around it and people thought he was picking on me because I had just written a letter and he wanted to make the opportunity or the most of the opportunity by bullying me. And Swami was very good at that. He used to really enjoy himself to make fun and then have a good laugh. So, that went on for some time. Finally, he didn't give me any instruction. He came he went to his residence and then he came out and one of my senior brothers there was doing his PhD that time. He said, what was Swami saying? Chutney, Idli, you will not get chutney in America. What, what was the conversation? I don't know the background. Then I explained to him the whole thing and then I said, sir, this is what Swami said. I didn't understand. So he said, oh, uh, he said, see, last, my, last year we all had got interview and Swami had again given us uh, Idli and chutney there in the interview room as uh, snacks. And we were all uh, having a conversation with Swami and there Swami asked, what is Idli, what is Chutney, that was the conversation. So we think in the interview room Swami is giving some secret mantras, some techniques to highest meditation and all of those who come out will be all Brahma Ginyanis. But in the interview room conversations are revolving around Idli and Chutney, sometimes Bada and Bonda also. So, uh, so uh, after all the answers, the, the conclusion was that God is Idli because Idli is big and the world is Chutney because Chutney is small. So that was the conversation conclusion. Then at the end Swami said, no, 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 no. There is no value for Idli without Chutney. So God is Chutney and the world is Idli. So I think when Swami told you that if you go to America, you will not get Chutney. In your context, Swami was hinting that if you go to America, you will not get Swami's proximity. So, you understand it in that context, maybe that is what Swami meant. So, it immediately started ringing bells in my ear, in my ears and my mind that this is what Swami hinted. And so, I told my father, I don't want to uh, continue with the green card if this is as clear a message that Swami has given and this is how I have understood it, I will let go of the green card facility. I don't want to. Fine. 2004, June, I finished my MBA. My MBA is over and I am supposed to be uh, taking up a job or whatever. But I somehow wanted to be with Swami, stay with him and get his guidance as to what he wants us to do. This sometimes can take many months, weeks, days or even years. They are called, there is a, there's a category of students called waiting boys. And these waiting boys used to wait in order to get Swami's guidance. Sometimes it could go into, even to a couple of years and they used to just wait in Prashant is doing some service till Swami personally tells them what is it that he wants them to do. So I was thinking that I should not be told to wait, I mean I don't, I shouldn't be having to wait for long but let's see what Swami has in store and that was the 10th of June, I just returned from Mumbai, Swami came to Prashant Lane from Vrindavan on the 7th and I was there on the 10th morning and I was uh, sitting in the, uh, in the students block, in the old students block in the third row, just near the Bhajan Hall entrance, in the morning the old students were allowed to go and sit near the Bhajan Hall entrance in the back side. So Swami talked to a few people, came to uh, uh, where I was sitting, spoke to a couple of students there and then he looked at me and he said, in Hindi, he said, what are you doing now? I said, Swami, MBA is over. So instantly, that morning I was telling my mother, I, she, had come with, she had come with me to spend some time in Prashantham while I wait for Swami's instruction. I said, I don't know how much time it will take, what Swami has in store for me. It can take a few weeks, few months. I don't know how I will be able to wait for that. She said, why are you thinking so much? You leave it to Swami and you surrender to him, you pray to him, that is all, that's all that you can do, that is all what you should do. So, uh, I was with that mindset, I had gone there, the very first day Swami comes and asks me this and then he said, MBA is over, in Hindi he said, MBA ho gaya, PhD karo, he said. And he said six times, PhD karo, PhD karo, PhD karo, he looked at Mr. Chakravarti who was there next to him and he said, PhD karo. So, in six 
कंजेक्यूटिव टाइम सी सेट पीएचडी करो पीएचडी करो पीएचडी करो इन स्पैन ऑफ अबाउट ट्वेंटी सेकेंड्स लेटर ऑन आई रियलाइज आई फिनिश माई पीएचडी एम फिल कम पीएचडी इन सिक्स ईयर दिस वॉज टू थाउजेंड फोर एंड इन टू थाउजेंड टेन अराउंड द सेम टाइम I had submitted my synopsis, which is marks the final culmination of the work, and then only thesis writing is left. That November, I got my degree. That time, when Swami said PhD, karo, then he called me a little bit ahead in in the near the veranda, and then this was six months after I had told him about America thing. We didn't hadn't had many conversation on that afterwards. So he called me near him and he said, "Tum bola tha ki tum foreign jata hai, jata hai kya?" You said that you are going to go abroad. Are you going? I said, "Nay, Swami, nay, jata hai. I am here only." He said, "Sure, nay, jata hai." I said, "Nay, jata hai, Swami." He said, "He said, okay, good." There was a time when people thought that Swami is forgetting things. He is not even knowing the difference between uh, Prashant Lem and Vrindavan. Many times in uh, sitting in Prashant Lem, Swami said, "I am going to go to Puttaparthi. Where is Puttaparthi?" So Swami was playing that leela at that point in time where he wanted to show. Because he had uh, just uh, undergone an operation, so a lot of people thought that Swami's health is not good, so he is forgetting things. So how Swami never forgot anything? He only made us forget that he is the Almighty and played all these tricks around us to really fool us and get us into his Maya and, and confusion. He literally used to give these glimpses when you are really, really awoken that no, it's not that he has forgotten. He knows everything. We are presuming it that way. It proceeded to 2005 May. I was uh, again blessed to go to Swami in Kodaikanal, and Swami asked me uh, in that uh, trip to give a talk. I gave a talk in Sai Shruti Mandir. It was over. Very happy. Uh, we sat down, and then immediately Swami said, "You know this boy. Last year he was going to go to America, but ticket, visa, everything was ready. Last minute he cancelled this trip. Now everybody sitting there did not know what the conversation was all about." I knew exactly what Swami was talking about. It was about 12 months after the conversation for PhD, and 18 months after the conversation when I asked his permission whether I should come here or not. Then I just smiled and I looked down. December 2006. I'm just taking one particular stream. I had just to know how Swami actually deals with the particular issue. We were uh, called into the interview room for. Uh, being blessed to accompany Swami to the Ati Rudra Mahayag. So there, uh, I was sitting outside, just uh, in the back side of the you know, in, uh, Bajan Hall door, and uh, waiting. I'm just thinking to myself. It was 22nd of December, or uh, 22nd of November. Uh, I had got the gold medal, and Swami had introduced me to the President of India that he is the gold medalist and all of that. And I was just thinking, one month is over. Swami has not spoken to me, and those kind of thoughts were going on in my mind. Suddenly, one of my classmates uh, indicates that Swami is calling you. Swami is calling you. So I started moving towards the interview room door. It seems uh, just while I was outside thinking about all this like this, inside Swami asked one of the my classmates, "Where is that boy who wanted to go to America?" <laughs> so this this classmate of mine didn't know what all this was about. It was purely between me and Swami. So he uh, he didn't understand which boy Swami and all that conversation went on. Then Swami described a little bit. and then uh, uh, the registrar understood that swami was referring to me and then i was called and then when i went inside the interview room swami looked at me and said ha this boy he wanted to go to america and then we sat down there swami spoke to us about the madras trip how ati rudra mahesh is going to be conducted and all of that happened and then at the end of it just another parallel message swami told uh, mr chakravarti he said see first he spoke to mr gokak who was there who was the vice chancellor He said, "These five boys give very good talks. If you permit them to accompany me, I can take them to Chennai to address the devotees there." The chancellor, who is Swami himself, is asking the vice chancellor whether five students can be exempted from class to be taken along with him to Chennai so that they can address students there. What is the symbolism of this kind of a conversation? Swami was very, very particular about hierarchy. Swami always used to tell the students, "You are not respecting the person; you are respecting his position. Whoever sits on a position has to be respected because it is the position which is the important dis- duty discharging opportunity, and that is what has to be given respect." And Swami every time himself used to ensure that all these hierarchies, 
all these uh, uh, formalities relating to the way organization should be run, he used to himself practice and show that this is the way to do it. So, Mr. Gokak said, Swami, of course, when is the question of asking me? It is a great blessing for the students to accompany you. They can, they should go, Swami. In fact, if you want, please take the whole set of MBA boys. We'll have all of them come and we can give them study leave, no problem, Swami. Swami said, no, 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 that much of accommodation arrangement is not there in Chennai. I will take only these many boys. Then Swami said, uh, told Mr. Chakravarti, see, uh, just tell Srinivasan, which is the All India President, uh, he was the uh, coordinating person in Chennai. Just tell Srinivasan, these five boys give very good speeches. If he can make arrangements for them to accompany me in the flight, then it will be very nice. So Mr. Chakran said, yes, yes, Swami, I will tell him all arrangements will be made. Again, the permission from the Vice Chancellor, the host institution, Prashant Nilayam. Permission from the inviter from the Chennai arrangements that Please ensure that these five people are accompanied and is it fine if they accompany me? These are the kind of nitty gritties which Swami used to communicate to us through his actions that this is the way you should behave and conduct in an organization. Then Swami looked at all of us, all five of us and said, see, this is a great opportunity for you. I am taking all five of you as my five life breaths in order to communicate my message in Chennai to all the devotees. So, do a good job, Swami said. See, that is the kind of, that is the kind of innocence and a kind of uh, grace that Swami used to display and shower through his actions that the students used to feel so overwhelmed. And what is it there in us that Swami should even think about us this way or even give us this kind of opportunity? But in lot of second thoughts, it is not just the opportunity, it is a lifetime of responsibility that by saying these things and doing these things, Swami used to impose on the students so that they feel responsible that Swami has had that faith in me and my capabilities. So for the rest of my life, I should be committed to it and live up to those expectations which Swami has placed before me. So Swami always used to keep the long term things in mind. Needless to say, we had a fantastic uh, trip in, US, in uh, Chennai and uh, the, the, the Atirudra Mahayagnam is very well documented and it was very good. And how Swami thundered at the political congregation about what is amiss and what should be done and what is not the way to do things, etc. etc. You must read the discourse of 21st of January 2007. Very, very nice discourse. It's there on Satisai Speaks. Then we move to, I mentioned in between last time, I had mentioned about how, uh, in, 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 in fact, Friday, about that uh, complete your PhD in two and a half years. If you recollect that part, Swami had said that in April 2007, when he gave me the ring and he said that, how long will you take to finish your PhD, finish in two and a half years. I mentioned that that time. You come to May 2007, and there we were in Kodai Canal again. And Swami was interacting with us, there was a senior devotee there. And all of a sudden, Swami asked that senior devotee, uh, do you know this boy? He said, yes, Swami, because I had uh, interacted with him while I was there and even in Chennai, Mr. G.K. Raman who was the chairman of Sundaram Finance Company, a very senior devotee. He passed away on Odom Day in 2007 inside Prashant Lim Mandir in front of Swami. He got a massive heart attack and passed away. What a blessed death. So, uh, Mr. G.K. Raman, uh, then Swami said, do you know this boy, what he has studied? So, he said, no, Swami. So, then Swami told me, huh, what have you studied? So I said, Swami, and I finished MBA. I told in Telugu, Swami, I finished MBA. Then Swami repeated, see, he finished MBA. Then he said, so I said, Swami, I finished MPhil. Then Swami said, see, he finished MPhil also. Then I said, Swami, now I'm currently doing PhD. And then Swami already got choked. He said, see, now he's currently doing PhD. This boy wanted to go to America, but he cancelled his visit. And see, he stayed back with Swami and how much of education he has acquired, how much of knowledge he has acquired. I am very happy. With a choked voice, Swami said that. Time and again, time and again, he reinforced the fact that he was happy at my decision, that I decided at that point in time that Swami doesn't want me to go, I should stay back. Irrespective of whatever kind of opportunities that may have envisaged, what my parents' wish was, which could have been accomplished at a later date, I decided to stay back. And Swami time and again, time and again tried to reinforce that I am very happy with your decision over a span of three years when in between there was no conversation about it. We fast forward, go to 2010, August, 
when I blessed my got my PhD blessed from Swami, I had uh, done my work on corporate stakeholders management. It is uh, inspired by Swami's uh, discourses in man management, where he says that business organization is not about only making money. It is about taking care of all the people who are associated with the business. And that's why Swami's message on management is called man management. Swami used to say of all the ends of business, money, machines, materials, uh, minutes, uh, and uh, one more I am not able to recollect now. Man is most important because it is man who gives value to the other. Whether it is money, machines, minutes, methods, all of these get their value because of man. So human beings should be at the core of any organization's functioning. And that is the focus of, that should be the focus of a successful <coughs> business organization. Rather that focus will give success to business organizations. Today we see increasingly the focus changing and turning from competition and these kind of commercial objectives to human objectives and ideas which are getting more importance. We are moving to an idea based era where ideas based out of the human ingenuity is what is getting real great importance. So in my study I found out through 1100 surveys and about 100 interviews with corporate executives that value systems implemented in organization and employee related policies are the core which gives success to the organization and that's what is the, the opinion of the current corporations in India based on my study. So I mentioned this to Swami when I was uh, getting the thesis blessed. I said, Swami, uh, based on uh, my survey research, this is what I found out. I did so many surveys, so many interviews. I was giving a kind of a report to Swami. So I said, Swami, and this is what you have already said in management. And Swami looked at me and he said, I already told that 20 years back, now after research you are finding the same thing. <laughs> so, what is the message of that is that what he has said 20 years back, 25 years back so casually as part of his discourses is so very profound that it takes about a quarter century for individuals and institutions to move to that level. He spoke about the need for sustainable development through the Ceiling and Desires program way back in 1976. I gave a talk on that yesterday at the Naperville Center, and which is uh, West Chicago Center? Yeah, West Chicago Center. I, I spoke about that. In 76, Swami spoke about ceiling on desires and how not wasting money, time, water, energy and uh, food is the core of an individual sadhaka's spiritual evolution and a good practice for all members of Sathasai organization. Today, the discourse on sustainable development which is there all over in all over the world is focusing on the importance of water, food, energy and money, the lack of equity in society and opulence on one side and total lack of uh, resources on the other. The entire focus is on these issues which Swami highlighted 30 years back. So whatever Swami has said, it has taken many, many decades for people to actually realize that. So see, I told you 20 years back, that is the importance, is the message that I got. That let us look into Swami's literature to see what really is important for ourselves as spiritual sadhakas and also for the world. The solutions to world problems verily can be found in Swami's literature. The essence which Swami has mentioned in three words, Daiva Preeti, Papa Preeti, Sanganiti is actually the tripod on which the solutions to world problems are based. Why is there not, why is there immorality in society? Why are there lack of morals? Because there is no fear of sin. If there is a fear of doing wrong, you know a wrong doing will lead to wrong outcome. I should not do, then automatically there will not be immoral activities. There will be morality. And when will that fear of sin come in? The fear of sin will come when you have love for God. When you have love for God, you know that a higher power is operating this creation. In Nyaya Shastra, there is this Pratyaksha Pramana, Paroksha Pramana, Shabda Pramana. This is there as a part of the Shadadarshana. It is said, and I was talking with one of the devotees in Chicago, that when we see a flight in the air flying, we know that there is a pilot inside, right? Without the pilot, the flight is not going to be moving, right? It's not autopilot. For that autopilot also, the pilot has to be in the flight, right? So it is said in the, the in the Nyaya Shastra that if there is a if, if there is something which is flying in the air or a vehicle moving, there has to be somebody who is driving that vehicle. There is somebody in the flight who is maneuvering it. Similarly, 
even if you cannot see the pilot, there is a pilot inside the flight, you cannot see a creator, but when the fact that this entire creation is in motion, the way things are happening impeccably day in and day out, there is the proof that there is a creator behind this entire creation. This is called logical reasoning, which is there in the, in the Nyaya Shastra, which Swami had spoken of during the 1993 summer course discourses, all the Shardarshanas. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Syankhya, Yoga, Puro Mimamsa and Uttar Mimamsa. So, just like that fact that there is a creator behind this creation and hence you need to love him because he is your true parent, you will have love for God. With that love for God, you will fear sin because you should not do wrong. This is his creation. You should be doing things rightly and therein will be morality in society. The entire solution lies therein. But that conviction that this is the solution to the problems of the world has to come from extensive study of Sai literature. It is not enough, Swami said, if you love me, it is important that you understand my message and practice it. And that will not come simply by attending bhajans or doing service activities without delving day in and day out into Swami's literature. At least two pages of Sadhya Sai speaks every single day. Just two pages. And you will know that Swami is conversing with you through those two pages. And so many doubts that we have, trivial doubts about the world, about the organization, about our relationships and about life itself will be very, very easily cleared. But that Swadhyaya, Swadhyaya, self-study has to be done by you. In fact, in the Shiksha Valli, it is said, Swadhyaya na pramaditavyam. You should not give up Swadhyaya. That is what the Acharya, the teacher is telling the students at the time of the convocation. I was speaking about the Shiksha Valli two days back and how the end of education is character and how character consists of all these things. One of the instructions the teacher gives is Swadhyaya na pramaditavyam. Don't give up self-study. That is an important part of your life. Even in the Yama Niyama, the first two of the Ashtanga Marga, in the Niyama, the second part, there is a five-fold thing in which Swadhyaya is one of the five. It is a very, very important part of our spiritual evolution. So, reading Swami's message is a habit which we need to cultivate at all stages. One of the elders whom I was interacting with said that I had read the Vahinis five years back. When I reread them again, I realized that there are so many things in them I did not know then, I am coming to know now. That is because we are evolving with every passing moment and the kind of insights that we get from that will be ever new. Because that's the nature of those scriptures, they are eternal. So, my suggestion and request to all of you is to continue to have that practice of reading. I went to Swami in 2011, I mentioned to you about the certificate I offered to Swami. That time I would also ask the question, Swami, what is it that you want me to do? So, should I apply for postdoc in the university? Because the administration is suggesting that and hence I am asking your guidance for that. Uh, Swami sent a word to Satyajit from uh, Swami's residence in Yajamandiram. Definitely tell him to apply. I applied for it. Uh, they gave me the uh, postdoctoral appointment in May. By then Swami had physically left. And I thought, who is it that is going to guide me? One of the devotees asked me the other day, could you share with us your experiences after Swami has left? Does Swami still continue to guide? I said, I will share that on Sunday. So that's what now I am showing you the transition of how Bhagawan continues to be as accessible to us as he was before. We need to make that effort to be connected to him and to depend on him alone for guidance. We fast forward, go to 2010, August, when I blessed my, got my PhD blessed from Swami. I had uh, done my work on corporate stakeholders management. It is uh, inspired by Swami's uh, discourses in man management where he says that business organization is not about only making money. It is about taking care of all the people who are associated with the business. And that's why Swami's message on management is called man management. Swami used to say of all the ends of business, money, machines, materials, uh, minutes, uh, and uh, one more I am not able to recollect now. Man is most important because it is man who gives value to the other. Whether it is money, machines, minutes, methods, all of these get their value because of man. So human beings should be at the core of any organization's functioning. 
and that is the focus of that should be the focus of a successful business organization rather that focus will give success to business organizations today we see increasingly the focus changing and turning from competition and these kind of commercial objectives to human objectives and ideas which are getting more importance we are moving to an idea based era where ideas based out of the human ingenuity is what is getting real great importance so in my study i found out through 1100 surveys and about 100 interviews with corporate executives that value systems implemented in organization and employee related policies are the core which gives success to the organization and that's what is the the opinion of the current corporations in india based on my study so i mentioned this to swami when i was uh, getting the thesis based i said swami uh, based on uh, my survey research this is what i found out i did so many surveys so many interviews i was giving a kind of a report to swami so i said swami and this is what you have already said in management and swami looked at me and he said i already told that 20 years back now after research you are finding the same thing <laughs> so what is the message of that is that what he has said 20 years back 25 years back so casually as part of his discourses is so very profound that it takes about a quarter century for individuals and institutions to move to that level he spoke about the need for sustainable development through the ceiling and desires program way back in 1976 i gave a talk on that yesterday at the nepal center and which is uh, west chicago center yeah west chicago center i uh, spoke about that in 76 swami spoke about ceiling on desires and how not wasting money time water energy and uh, food is the core of a individual sadhaka's spiritual evolution and a good practice for all members of sadhaka sai organization today the discourse on sustainable development which is there all over in all over the world is focusing on the importance of water food energy and money the lack of equity in society and opulence on one side and total lack of uh, resources on the other the entire focus is on these issues which swami highlighted 30 years back so whatever swami has said it has taken many many decades for people to actually realize that so see i told you 20 years back that is the importance is the message that i got that let us look into swami's literature to see what really is important for ourselves as spiritual sadhakas and also for the world the solutions to world problems verily can be found in swami's literature the essence which swami has mentioned in three words daiva preeti papa preeti sanganiti is actually the tripod on which the solutions to world problems are based why is there not why is there immorality in society why are there lack of morals because there is no fear of sin if there is a fear of doing wrong you know wrong doing will lead to wrong outcome i should not do then automatically there will not be moral activities there will be morality and when will that fear of sin come in the fear of sin will come when you have love for god when you have love for god you know that a higher power is operating this creation in nyaya shastra there is this pratyaksha pramana paroksha pramana shabda pramana this is there is a part of the shada darshan it is said and i was talking with one of the devotees in chicago that when we see a flight in the air flying we know that there is a pilot inside right without the pilot the flight is not going to be moving right it's not autopilot for that autopilot also the pilot has to be in the flight right so it is said in the in the nyaya shastra that if there is a if, if there is something which is flying in the air or a vehicle moving there has to be somebody who is driving that vehicle there is somebody in the flight who is maneuvering it similarly even if you cannot see the pilot there is a pilot inside the flight you cannot see a creator but when the fact that this entire creation is in motion the way things are happening impeccably day in and day out there is the proof that there is a creator behind this entire creation this is called logical reasoning which is there in the in the nyaya shastra which swami had spoken of during the 1993 summer course discourses all the shatdarshanas nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga puro mimamsa and uttar mimamsa so just like that fact that there is a creator behind this creation and hence you need to love him because he is your true parent you will have love for god with that love for god you will fear sin because you should not do wrong this is his creation you should be doing things rightly 
and therein will be morality in society. The entire solution lies therein. But that conviction that this is the solution to the problems of the world has to come from extensive study of Sai literature. It is not enough, Swami said, if you love me, it is important that you understand my message and practice it. And that will not come simply by attending bhajans or doing service activities without delving day in and day out into Swami's literature. At least two pages of Sadesai speaks every single day. Just two pages. And you will know that Swami is conversing with you through those two pages. And so many doubts that we have, trivial doubts about the world, about the organization, about our relationships and about life itself will be very, very easily cleared. But that Swadhyaya, Swadhyaya, self-study has to be done by you. In fact, in the Shiksha Valli, it is said, Swadhyaya na pramaditavyam. You should not give up Swadhyaya. That is what the Acharya, the teacher is telling the students at the time of the convocation. I was speaking about the Shiksha Valli two days back and how the end of education is character and how character consists of all these things. One of the instructions the teacher gives is, Swadhyaya na pramaditavyam. Don't give up self-study. That is an important part of your life. Even in the Yama Niyama, the first two of the Ashtanga Marga, in the Niyama, the second part, there is a five-fold thing in which Swadhyaya is one of the five. It is a very, very important part of our spiritual evolution. So reading Swami's message is a habit which we need to cultivate at all stages. One of the elders whom I was interacting with said that I had read the Vahinis five years back. When I reread them again, I realized that there are so many things in them I did not know then, I am coming to know now. That is because we are evolving with every passing moment and the kind of insights that we get from that which we ever knew. Because that's the nature of those scriptures, they are eternal. So my suggestion and request to all of you is to continue to have that practice of reading. I went to Swami in 2011, I mentioned to you about the certificate. I offered to Swami. That time I would also ask the question, Swami, what is it that you want me to do? So, should I apply for postdoc in the university? Because the administration is suggesting that and hence I am asking your guidance for that. Uh, Swami sent a word to Satyajit from uh, uh, Swami's residence in Yajamandram. Definitely tell him to apply. I applied for it. Uh, they gave me the uh, postdoctoral appointment in May. By then Swami had physically left. And I thought, who is it that is going to guide me? One of the devotees asked me the other day, could you share with us your experiences after Swami has left? Does Swami still continue to guide? I said, I will share that on Sunday. So that's what now I am showing you the transition of how Bhagawan continues to be as accessible to us as He was before. We need to make that effort to be connected to Him and to depend on Him alone for guidance. So, the first thing that happened was I got a dream uh, when Swami was in the hospital. I was thinking Swami is not well, what will happen? None of us imagine that this will happen. But I got a dream there. I was sitting in the Prashantile Mandir. And uh, in that, I was sitting and I was, as it, is, it was introduced that I was the editor of uh, the hostel, hostel, University Hostel Publications Division. So, in the dream also, I was sitting and uh, making some corrections in the manuscript. And all of a sudden, Swami comes from behind me. I don't know Swami is coming behind me. He comes from behind me and starts looking, peeking through my shoulders as to what I am doing. Now, I don't know Swami is standing behind me, but all the students around me are looking at me and looking beyond me. So, I thought, what is happening? What happened? So, all of a sudden, I turned behind and in the dream, I see Swami standing behind me. And then Swami said, hmm, very good. You must ensure that you communicate the right message, the right meaning from my message in whatever work that you do. And second thing Swami said, always ensure that you behave like a good Sai student. These were the two things Swami said. He was in the hospital that time and this was the dream that I got in that three week period. So after Swami left physically, I knew what he wanted me to do. We were wondering whether we should continue with our publications activities or we should reduce the scope of it. I decided to the contrary, we increase the scope of it because Swami said, you have to ensure that you communicate the right interpretation of my message. So I thought it was the right opportunity to go ahead with that and proceed in a much bigger scale than we were doing. And we expanded in the last five years during Swami's physical presence and thereafter, the hostel has 
attempted to put together five books on Swami's discourses, 108 discourses, three books on conversations of students with Swami from 91 to 2004, coming to about 1000 pages of conversations. We always look up to conversations by other masters. There are so many books, very interesting. We must make an attempt to read the kind of conversations Swami had with students. Interview room, outside, Trai Vrindavan, Bhajan Hall, Purnachandra Auditorium, all of them have been attempted to be put together. And then we put together all the experience books from 1985 to 2010, 60th birthday, 65th birthday. So we put together 600 experiences of students with Swami. We put together all the discourses of Swami on management. We put together Swami's in discourses on special things like on avatars, what Swami has said about all the avatars, including himself. Then another book which we worked on, what Swami has said on the Mahapurushas, the prophets, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, and then the Acharya, Shankara, Ramanuja, Vallabha, Madhavacharya, and all the saints. All of this we put together in the form of books which are available and accessible to the devotees. Then we ventured that now it's the era of social media. So we need to reach out to the devotees through the medium with which they are comfortable. These are very good ideas which even the organization can attempt to work on, focus on, innovative. Nobody gave us this idea. Nobody came and said, you do this. But if you are constantly thinking what I should be doing in order to further Swami's message, like one of the devotees asked me yesterday, there are very, very uh, similar kind of things happening in the organization. Why can't we do something different? I said the best way to do something different is you do it yourself. Because the organization gives everybody an opportunity to, have, uh, to offer their services to Bhagwan in whichever field of expertise they have. You have an innovative idea, concretize it, put it forward and execute it. And that's what we did. We said we need to bring out Swami's message on social media. So we decided we'll start a blog. What we have in the blog, we don't have time to write new things. We'll put together all the material that has been collected. There isn't sufficient authentic information on Swami and students on the internet. That was what we felt at that time. Let us have authentic, genuine information, incidents, experiences of people with real names, faces and affiliations. And let us communicate that to the world. Whoever is interested to know about Swami should have access to that. Swami and students. So we started a blog on Ganesh Chaturthi Day, Satasai with students, Satasai with students.blogspot.com. And we said we will have five sections. Discourses, experiences, conversations, management lessons, this day, that age, and a little later we started a song for the soul. In these six categories, we said we'll put together information week by week, which is relating to Swami and students alone, and put together a repository, a treasure house of such rare and useful material. And anybody who's interested can access. You can enter your email address on that, and that will send the Google will send you a link. You click on that link. Thereafter, every week you get a automatic update in your mailbox. We thought, let's try, how is it? Many of the teachers were a little apprehensive. Don't get into social media. It has so many limitations. There may be so many things. I myself don't have a Facebook page. But we attempted to use Facebook in order to communicate this kind of material. We put it on blog post. We take every day one one thing and then circulate through Facebook. So every day you get a feed through the Facebook and you have the collection permanently on the blog. So we used all these ideas, youngsters, the, my suggestion to the organization would be to try and channelize the wise energies into areas in which they are passionate about. Our teachers in the hostel gave us the freedom that you want to use social media and IT to spread Swami's message, try it. Be cautious, be, uh, be alert to ensure that the dignities of the occasions are maintained, but go ahead with it. We did all of that today, 30 months later, we have been successfully able to put together about 800 posts on these themes. In 30 months, we had 1 million visits to the blog. 1 million visits out of which only 40% were from India, 20% from US and 40% from the rest of the world. So 400,000 visits from all parts of the world, 200,000 visits from US and 400,000 visits from India. And through Facebook, we started this thought for the day uh, service. Uh, we thought we'll have what is called this day that year. So one of the students was very enthusiastic. He said, brother, why don't we compile discourses Swami has given on different days? So Pavam, he went through the entire Sadasai speaks. 
he called out first january second january third january fourth january like all 365 days a year in which year swami has given discourse on which day he mapped the whole thing found those discourses took excerpts from that put it on the particular day and put that entire compilation together we wanted to make it a book first we thought let's start with using it for communicating to devotees on the social media so we put up one thought every day on the facebook page along with a nice photograph of swami we have about 5 to 9000 visits just for the thought of the day every single day that is the kind of positive use that we can make of the social media and it in order to reach out because the current generation is on this if you want to tap the current generation you have to speak their language so i used to talk about examples of radio and misuse of radio in the 60s in the 70s and 80s he started talking about the misuse of television and in 90s and 2000s he started talking about the misuse of internet examples given by swami's discourses also changed because technology was changing but the same thing can be positively used so we had first audio discourses in audio tapes then we had video discourses in vhs tapes and then the audio visuals started coming up with cds dvds and now radio sai has its own channel across so internet and media can be very positively used and with the message that swami gave that uh, that ensure that people understand the correct interpretation of my message we started this and it was so successful just 5 minutes more january 2013 we were putting together a play on adi shankaracharya adi shankaracharya was a very very dear figure of bhagwan amongst all the people that swami used to talk about he used to address adi shankaracharya with lot of respect though a lad only of 32 years the kind of work he did in his lifetime is unimaginable swami always says ramudu krishna do he will say with singular uh, respect but for adi shankaracharya those who understand telugu he will say shankar lavaro he will just say with respect g aap in hindi he say na tum and aap with shankaracharya he used to use the uh, the pronoun of aap that kind of respect swami had for the work that great sage and prophet had done so we were working on a discourse on shankaracharya a uh, drama on shankaracharya's life and we put together discourses which swami had given and uh, wrote the script accordingly and it was a very successful drama everybody was very happy and uh, they got very new insights on swami's message on life and message of shankaracharya and uh, uh, all through the while while i was directing and coordinating this whole program i was having this thought in my mind by then i had uh, reached the age of 32 and shankaracharya left the world at the age of 32 it seems jesus also left the world at the age of 32 i didn't have fear that i am going to move on i had a different kind of fear in my mind i said all these great souls who swami keeps quoting and giving examples of they have accomplished so much in such a small age right you know what jesus did in 32 years you know what shankaracharya did in 32 years by the age of 8 he had mastered all the vedas by the age of 16 he had passions on all the vedas and then his life was to end at 16 he got an extension in the next 16 years he went around all the corners of india three times and spread the message of advaita non dualism and established four mats or monasteries in the four parts of india to to continue to sustain this endeavor of sanatana dharma or the eternal way of life i said i have done nothing swami what will happen to me that was the kind of fear feeling i had swami please guide me what i should do i have done nothing in my life that was the kind of feeling i continued to have i mentioned it to some one of my teachers also that i am getting this thought i said why are you worrying about all this you focus on the drama drama was over everything went off very well then couple of weeks later i get a dream and this swami and me sit together and in that swami he says uh i i asked the same question to swami swami says see you are a researcher isn't it i said yes swami he said what does the researcher do the first thing a researcher does is makes a table of contents swami is telling me in english the researcher first makes a table of contents these are the things i am going to do in this order anybody who is in the research field even for that matter any field you plan out what you wish to do you make an index you make a table of contents swami said a researcher makes a table of contents and then scrupulously follows it and then tries to achieve the project based on what he has outlined for himself small modifications here and there swami said similarly i want you to make a table of contents for your life you decide what you want to do and then achieve that with full quality for swami quantity is not important he said i want quality you deliver quality 
you don't need to compare yourself with anybody what shankaracharya did what jesus did what i did we are examples but you need to have your own agenda and work towards it so make your toc a table of contents and fully focus on it with total quality i got my answer how uniquely swami can respond to us in our language in our field of expertise answering spiritual questions through research methodology solutions is only capable is only possible with the way swami deals with us so that is what kind of clarity i got at that time after that i had never got that doubt come may 2013 i had got invited to a conference at harvard for making a presentation so i came here i had interacted with a lot of faculty members at harvard mit and others to interview them for my research works i always interview experts to find out what their opinions are on different issues in fact some one of the, the devotees were asking me what kind of questions you ask them so while i ask them a lot of technical questions i also try and probe and find out do they think whether values make or play any role in the specific work that they are doing do you th- do they think that they have ethical dilemmas do they think that value systems and ethical di- and ethics and morality play any role in business in the financial system in the problems that america went through i try to probe and find out what are the kind of opinions they have on this and are there any similarities in what they have said and swami has said and is it that they are clear and not able to practice or they are not aware of it at all and to my uh, joy everybody is aware of what the problem is the difficulty lies in practicing it and convincing a system towards practicing it and not the lack of awareness so i did that and i came back to prashanthanya uh the university wanted me to join as a faculty member i was saying that i want swami's guidance swami continues to guide each one of us in his own way directly one to one i don't want to take a decision on my own because if i'm committed to the university i should give my full time so i said sir please give me a time i'll take a year to take a call on that so they said okay <coughs> september 2013 i still remember i think it was first early morning of 1st of september i am sitting in swami's room upstairs about the bhajan mandir and swami and i are talking and i asked swami swami what is it that you want me to do the university is asking me to join so swami looks at me and he says i do not judge people by the number of years they stay at prashanthinilayam i judge people based on the commitment they show to this place when they are here then swami paused then in, in telugu he continued and i am translating in my opinion swami always used to say na uddeshamulo in my opinion very 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 nice way of communicating even when you want to talk with your children you want to talk with your colleagues you always say in my opinion this is what it is instead of saying do this you say in my opinion do this even with sudan swami used to say that in my opinion this is the way to do it even trust members in my opinion this is the way we should do so swami said in the dream in my opinion in your stay here you have shown 100% commitment so i am very happy then swami paused for a while and indicated that after your post doctoral research you go out then i asked a couple of more personal questions to swami swami answered swami said i will tell you later matter over i didn't reveal anything to anybody i thought that let me first understand the implications i am able to tell you with this clarity now many months years later but it took me quite some time to understand what swami said but i understood that over the next 6 months what swami meant when he told this to me in september in november 2013 as brother mentioned i my book soulful corporations was published by springer uh, some of the professors here had said that when your uh, book is published you please send us a copy so i sent them a copy uh, i sent one to howard business school and a couple of other in university of virginia and a couple of other business schools they wanted a copy i had sent it to them uh 2013 november december that is 2014 uh, uh 2014 january i get a mail from the harvard professor here that we are going to have a training program on corporate social responsibility in india now just to give you a revelation how without our knowledge swami puts us in a field and de- help and makes us deliver so much without realizing why we are delivering the concept context of that we understand a couple of years later i my area is corporate stakeholders management i don't want to get into the jargon of it it is one area the subset of which is social responsibility two years earlier after i finished my post doc after swami left i thought parallelly i'll start i have written a draft manuscript with swami and blessed 
and we, I thought I'll convert it into a full-fledged book. So between September 2011 and uh, uh, March 2013, I was working on this book. I finished it and I submitted it to the publisher who accepted a couple of publishers. Finally, it got finalized with uh, Springer and it got accepted. It was in the process of publishing. In the meanwhile, the government of India, the first in the whole world, passes a law that you should all corporations above a particular profit level should spend 2% of their profits for social activities. The whole focus shifted to the area on which I have written a book. <laughs> and I wrote that book not knowing that this is the direction in which the corporate world is going to move. So that, so that book was ready. These people asked me, please share your book with us. I sent that book to uh, one of the professors, the prof our professor. He liked it. He said, we are having a training program in Mumbai in February. It's a collaboration with Harvard University, World Bank and Government of India. Would you like to come as a uh, visiting faculty for that? I said, sure, I'll take the university's permission and come. It's a four-day program. I will come. That program was supposed to happen in 2012 February. It got postponed by two years and happened in 2014 February. So between 2012 February and 2014 February, I finished my book, the government of India passes a law, I publish my book, I send it to Harvard, they have planned parallel a program, they invite me to Mumbai. When I come to Mumbai for that program, they tell me that uh, Harvard is interested in doing advanced research in this field, we are looking for uh, collaborations, would you be interested in working with us on this project for, for a two year period. By then Swami had already indicated to me that I should move out. So I said, uh, okay, sir, I would be interested. Please uh, share with me the details. Let us take it ahead based on if it is mutually convenient. In 2014, April, I finish my <coughs> postdoc. In, uh, subsequently, in a matter of month or two, the letter comes from Harvard. After the letter comes from Harvard, I apply for a fellowship. The Tata Trust, uh, uh, the Tata Companies Trust give me a fellowship as to pursue this postdoc. And finally, I end up in September 2014 in America. And on the 13th of September, I arrived, 15th I was supposed to join. On the morning of 15th, early morning, I'm sleeping in my uh, in the house in Boston. And early morning, uh, Swami comes in my dream. He is uh, giving darshan. He comes smiling from Purun Chandra, walking, giving darshan. After that, he comes near us. He uh, uh, talks to me something, saying do this, do that, some, some very general stuff. After that, he moves on. He comes back, by then we students are sitting in one block, Swami comes and sits there and starts talking to us. And in the process of talking, he pats my hand two, three times while he's talking. So in that brief dream, he gave darshan, smiled, came, spoke to me, came, patted me and then he left. That was the day I was going to join Harvard Business School for my postdoctoral research that particular morning. So the journey which began 12 to 13 years earlier, when Swami said in the dream, this boy wanted to go to Harvard University and he left that and came to my university. 12-13 years later, through so much of training, experience, understanding, exposure and grooming, Swami sent me back here for this kind of an experience while I completed all my education at Prashantinyam. And in his opinion, I was now mentally and physically, intellectually, professionally ready to be in US for this particular project. What I wish to communicate through this is that, through one part of my experiences with Swami is that, whether Swami is physically there, I shared with you how Swami used to work. After Swami physically left, how Swami used to work. How he used to guide then, how he used to guide now. And this, the whole thread of our association, our relationship with him, how it is unbroken. It is the same the way it used to be. The same style, the same methodology, the same way of guidance and that continued relationship exists even till this day. That's why my firm conviction and belief is that whether Swami is physically there or not, while well, we very, 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 very much miss Him, we must be equally very, very, very much convinced that He is a part of our life, He is there to guide us and he is just as much a distance away as he wants to be as he was then. When Swami was physically there, we could think that Swami is there so we can go and ask him and he will answer. If he doesn't want to answer five years also, he will not give an answer. It is the same case with now. If he wants to answer, he will take his own time. When he feels that we are ready and ripe for it, he will come forward and give us the answer. But he remains as accessible to us on a heart-to-heart -heart basis 
as he used to be then. A small desire somewhere in the corner of my father's heart that I should pursue some kind of a uh, project or a degree or whatever at Harvard got culminated after 14-15 years. And then legal requirements, opportunities, geographies, situations don't matter. If you stick to him and you say that I have taken that one step towards Swami, he will take the remaining 100 steps, ensure that he gives you what he wants to give you, ensure that any lurking desire or genuine value adding productive desire in your mind also gets fulfilled at a later date and you are fully molded into the complete whole that he wants to make you. So the, my effort this morning was to share this part of my life, how Bhagwan has and continues to be very much our friend philosopher and guide, our master, our beloved parent and of course for most of us our God. That's the essence of what I wish to share. There are a couple of uh, questions which have come. One of them uh, I have already answered and two or three of them I will attempt to answer. Just give me five more minutes. Uh, one of them is, how did you feel when you first heard about Swami? Uh, I never get, got a chance to feel anything about it because I was born in a family which is devotees of Swami since 1965. So I was born in a family which was already devoted to Swami. And uh, since the I went first to Prashant Lims at the age of two, and since then, I have always uh, known Swami as, uh, as the Divine and my whole relationship. I have known Him as Divine. My understanding of His Divinity, my actual experience of His Divinity and then my life getting molded and enacted according to the knowledge and desire of this Divinity has been a process which I have undergone over the last three decades. The next question is... <clears throat> Yes, dear Swami, it has been difficult to love all in the same way. Can you please throw some light? Very recently, in one of the thought for the days which we put up on Facebook, in one of the discourses, Swami mentions, I, have, I keep on telling you to love everybody, but I know it is not so easy because everybody is so difficult to deal with, forget loving them. So what you should do? Swami gives the answer. He says, I don't tell you to love the person. I tell you to love the God which is residing in that person and the same God is residing in all of us. So when you realize that, that the God in me is the same as the God in him, only the external vesture is different. Whether we are wearing a kurta pajama or a pant shirt or a sari, we are all human beings. The dressing doesn't differentiate whether we are human or not, right? It may only differentiate our country or region of origin. Similarly, whatever the body and the external appearance, the soul inside is the same and that soul is an aspect of the creator. Mamai Vamsho Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana Krishna had said in the Bhagavad Gita that the soul in the individual is a part of my eternal being and in the Narayan Suktam it is said Neela Toveda Madhyastha Vidyul Lekheva Bhaswara Nivara Shuka Vatanvi Pita Bhaswatya Nupama Tasya Shikhaya Madhye Paramatma Vyavasthita Between the 9th and 12th vertebral column lies a light of blue color which continues to shine resplendently with Kullekheva Vasura like lightning in the sky it continues to shine with all effulgence in man's own form that is the Atma Tattva which is referred to that doesn't mean when you open the 9th and 12th vertebrae you will find the light shining that is not a physical bulb it is the Atma Tattva it is the principle which is just like the electricity, it is not visible, but all this light is shining because of the electricity. This speaker is, uh, this microphone is working because of the unseen electricity. Similarly, the Atma Tattva is energizing every single individual. That blue light is same in uncle and auntie and daddy and mummy and brother and sister and grandmother and grandfather, African, American, Antarctican, uh, uh, European. It is no different. Same blue light in everybody and that blue light is a spark of divinity. This is the essence of Advaita Tattva. When we say somebody has passed away, right? What do we say? Somebody has passed away. Mr. So and so has passed away. But Mr. So and so's body is lying in his house or in the morgue and Mr. So and so's body is going to get cremated. We will never say Mr. So and so is getting cremated. Will we ever say that? Does any language permit to say that Mr. So and so will get cremated? Mr. So and so's body will get cremated. Then where is Mr. So and so? Mr. So and so has passed away. But his body is lying there. Then is Mr. So and so the one whose body is lying there 
or Mr. So and So is the one who has passed away. And on analysis of this fact, we realize that Mr. So and So is not the body. Mr. So and So was residing in the body, and that resident in the body is what the Atma Tattva is all about. That Atma Tattva is a spark of the Paramatma Tattva. This is the constant understanding which we need to have, and you need to love that person's. Soul, his spirit, his atma. Then you don't need to be worried about what is externally, because you know the same God is in him. It's very difficult, but what is easy? As somebody was asking me, spirituality is so difficult. I said, what is easy? Was walking easy? It took two years to learn walking. Right when we were a kid, we fell down so many times. Mummy held our hand. She used to keep saying, come, come, come. She used to keep going behind so that we increase our span of walking. And over two years, we picked up to walk. Right? Today, walking is so easy. One of the teachers asked Swami, Swami, spirituality is so difficult. What should we do? So Swami said, How in this example of walking, Swami only gave. It took two years for you to learn something as simple as walking, which is such a second nature to you today that if you go to the washroom at night, you don't even need to think that you are walking. It's just mechanical. You walk, go, finish, come back. Right? You go to the bathroom and come back. Nobody needs to tell you. That's become your second nature. Why? Because you have practiced alphabets. You have practiced. Today you can write books, right? Syllables you have practiced. Today you can give speeches. Ragas you have practiced. Today you can give music programs. Abhinaya you have practiced. Today you can give dance programs, right? All of these things started with the single effort to learn an art form, practice it, and master it. Same is the case. Swami said with spirituality. When all of these things, including a degree, takes 15 years for you. You are asking for the highest degree, which is God's grace. Should you not practice and wait for that degree to be conferred on you while you continue to give your tests? That's why Swami used to say, "No test is my taste." What is the meaning of that sentence? Just like a teacher takes tests after you finish a particular class, so that to know whether you are ready to pass into the next class to get promoted, God tests us in our regular life so that we clear that particular stage. And move to the next level. That's why Swami used to say, "Your test is my taste. I have tasted whether you are able to clear the test. And now you are ready for promotion or one more year continuation in the same class. That is how our journey is. So we need to continue to be focused on that. Why are there so many sufferings in the world? Anityam asukham lokam imam prapya bhajasvamam. This is said in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna." Anityam asukham lokam. This Swami has said in one of the man management discourses. There is this famous uh, story that Swami has narrated. One person went into the uh, into a restaurant in India. It is called it is called military hotel. Military hotel means it is a non-veg restaurant, right? Vegetarian food will not be available. That person did not read the board, but he entered that restaurant and he goes and asks the waiter there, uh, "I want vegetarian food." So that waiter tells him, "Are you? Uh, do you have some uh, visual defect?" He said, "Why?" He said, "I put such a big board outside that this is a non-vegetarian restaurant. We will not get vegetarian food. Why are you wasting your time and mine? Please leave." So he goes outside actually and sees and says, "Yes, it was written there, military hotel." Swami said, "When you entered this world, you were told that this world is anityam asukham lokam. This world is anityam. It is temporary." And it is asukham. It is not capable of giving any joy. The joy which this world gives are also temporary. No joy is permanent. Whether it is a small joy of getting eating an ice cream or a joy of becoming a millionaire, none of these joys are permanent. They will last for that point in time. Every time we look for the next stage. I am a kid. I want to grow big. I will have joy. When I grow big, I want to have a job. I will have joy. Once I have a job, I want to get married. I will have joy. Once I get married, I want to have children. I will have joy. After I have children, I will wait for them to grow up. I will have joy when I see them become responsible. After they grow up, I want to see them get married. Their marriage will give me joy. In my old age, I have only one wish. I should see you having your child. I will become a grandparent. That will give me joy. There is no end to these joys because these joys are so time bound. Because they are anityam, they are not permanent. They are meant to be transient. Because that is the nature of this world. This world is not capable of giving permanent joy. It is the nature of this world to give impermanent joy. Because it is impermanence. It is based on impermanence. It is based on the panchabhutas. 
even the avatar when he comes in the physical form his body is made of panchabhutas it panchabhutas means the five elements you know what the five elements are the panchabhuta anything made out of that will always have its limitation this entire creation is made out of that it will have its own limitations but what is the solution the next part of that verse is the solution so uh, that krishna says imam prapya bhajaswamam after having realized this truth that this world is temporary after having realized that it is not capable of giving me permanent joy stop looking for joys in your worldly ways of life and think of me because living in my presence living in my thoughts living in that constant integrated awareness that swami used to talk what is constant integrated awareness reminding yourself all the time that you are divine you are divine you are divine you are divine 21600 times a day our body tells us our breath tells us you are god you are god so hum so hum so hum swami said this in the akhand bhajan in 2007 he said that you all are so happy you all have done akhand bhajan but this is not akhand bhajan this is khand bhajan it is only part time bhajan like you do in the centers one hour a week that is only a short capsule which you are doing you have to do a khand bhajan non stop bhajan and how will that happen that will happen when you concentrate on your self on your breath which is telling you 21600 times a day that you are god you are god you are god why don't you focus on that every activity that you do whether it is cooking or or or, or cleaning or writing speaking sleeping do with the awareness that you are god then you will yourself become divine then whatever you do will give you ultimate joy that is the problem which we have we are seeing the sufferings outside the solutions to the suffering does not lie outside the solutions to the suffering lies inside like i mentioned yesterday golden age is not going to descend from the heavens one fine day you get up and the river front looks golden the sea towers look golden all the buildings here are having a golden finish the birds are chirping heavenly songs the angels in the skies are showering flowers there is not going to be any day of this kind of golden age golden age will come when every individual aspiring for the golden age works towards it from within when you have reached that stage when you realize that i am that divine principle you will automatically see everything as golden not in the real sense in the symbolic sense you will realize that everything is divine you will realize that everything like you know that experience of vivekananda when ramkrishna patted his head he saw everything in in covered with a white light you have seen the you read of that experience in autobiography of a yogi when yukteswar giri hits the head of paramhamsa yogananda and he sees everything and covered with the beautiful white light and he experiences such inexplicable joy that he has never experienced it before and he is in that he doesn't realize he doesn't come out of it for hours on end till he is brought out of it that hello you have work to do for this world this is an experience to show you what you really are now get out and start working vivekananda told ramakrishna that can i not stay in this experience forever ramakrishna said are you not being selfish you have to work so that everybody gets it experience you have to spread the message of sanatan dharma so that everybody gets it experience this experience was just to show you give you a taste that this is what you are this is what you are capable of then you will no longer see sufferings you will start working towards alleviating that sufferings because you you have to give solutions to the world problems based on swami has said the last question which i have here as a student setbacks or failures are something that cause great sadness in me it also spurs laziness in future work with the mentality that i may not succeed anyway being a former student yourself how do you deal with such failures and rejected feelings yourself has swami offered any advice yes swami has offered any advice many advices if i can use that word and the advice had come from krishna himself 5000 years ago and all prophets have spoken about it it's a very famous verse which we always quote but we do not contemplate on it karmandeva adhikaraste मा फलेशु कदाचन यू हैव अ राइट ओनली ऑन योर एक्शन यू डू नॉट हैव अ राइट ऑन योर रिजल्ट वी हैव टू कन्विंस आवर सेल्फ ऑफ दिस फैक्ट दैट वी हैव अ राइट ओनली ऑन व्हाट वी डू सो व्हेदर यू डू गुड और बैड इज द डिस्क्रिमिनेशन व्हिच यू यूज एंड द आउटकम ऑफ दैट इज नॉट इन योर हैंड यू कैन नॉट कंट्रोल द आउटकम यू कैन ओनली कंट्रोल द इनपुट लाइक योर गूगल सर्च whatever you write 
is whatever will come right if you misspell it you will get a misspelled output right because you are the composer of that particular google program the computer is only calculating and tabulating it in that format the composer's way of thinking has been superimposed into the computer's way of delivering same way in life we have only control over what we do when swami says whatever happens is good for you good for you good for you it means whatever is happening whether it is karmic circumstantial or contextual it is good for us based on our past present and future which swami has envisaged for us but we have control of doing our best because swami said god will not judge you based on the output of your work god will judge you based on the intention of your work why you have done it what what context in which you did it with what purpose you did it you help somebody to get name and fame or you help somebody because you could not see their suffering you wanted to alleviate it you did charity because you wanted to show that you are a superior person or you did charity because you felt the responsibility from inside that god has given me surplus let me help the lesser fortunate brethren in the society the intention is what god will see not the output so even if we don't succeed it is for our understanding that we have not succeeded for god we have already succeeded the moment we have put in the efforts so my suggestion to everybody is let us all focus only on efforts let us not focus on output because an output based life is only visible and given importance in the world the work a day world outside the professional commercial world investment interest land rent capital profit this is the fundamentals of economics not the fundamentals of spirituality in spirituality there is only one fundamental bhavam swami always used to say i am bhava priya i am the one who loves feelings not bahya priya not the external appearances and outputs that is the answer to this question he is interested in intention whatever activity you do do with the best feelings and intention output is left to god's hand it is his world it is his creation we did not decide we'll take this form we did not decide we'll have as much hair on our head we did not decide we will have this color of our skin we did not decide that we'll be born in this family we did not decide we'll be born in this religion we did not decide we'll be born in this geography when all of this was decided by him as being good for us and giving us the skill sets and talents and the limbs and the thoughts and the skills to deliver it let us leave the output also to him why have we taken all the responsibility in ourselves to deliver but give your best because that is your duty so i always used to think that's what he told arjuna you do your duty don't worry who is on the other side your dharma says you do your duty that dharma is eternally telling you you do your duty in the best way possible as i said on friday be the best lawyer be the best doctor be the best housewife be the best software professional be the best student be the best sportsman be the best dancer be the best singer because that is your offering to god everything when you do with the feeling of offering to god it automatically becomes a matter of satisfaction for him after that tyagaraja mirabai did not compose bhajans and songs in order to please the carnatic maestros of the era they composed all of them only to express their love for god but when that came with so much of feeling even today half a millennium after they have left this world they continue to inspire move touch and emote in terms of tears in many of our eyes when we hear their compositions that this is true love for god let our work our deeds our actions leave that inspiration behind as a legacy for others that this is true devotion this is what swami gave them and this is what sai devotees truly stand for jai sai ram
for spending three days with us, sharing wonderful experiences, taking down the memory lane, by lanes, Mumbai, Dundal, Patti, Kodai Canal, and all different places. Please give a big round of applause. Brother Dr. Shashan, we truly believe it was Swami who was speaking through you when you said that it is Swami who speaks through me and all the messages, the, the words that you spoke today, I think it cleared a lot of questions, answers that the devotees had here. And that's also one of the reasons you would see that not many, the, the placards that were sent to you for questions did not come back to you. Because you answered all the questions even before they could ask. I would like to uh, invite Dr. Prabhakar Bharat uh, to give a token of our appreciation uh, to Dr. Jishanka. Thank you. 